uh, we have to realize there's things that uh, without Christ uh, we're alienated from God and and God's power is great so I want to just share one little bitty thing before we begin uh, and I remind you I think I did this last last week but to remind you in Exodus chapter 33 Moses asked God to show him show me your power Lord and God says, I'll let my goodness pass before you. And that's in Exodus chapter 33, uh, think about verse 18. But now what happens is when you listen carefully to those scriptures, Moses is asking for God's awesome power. He wants to see the power. And God says, I'll show it to you. I'll let my goodness pass by you. In other words, what is he saying? His glory is His goodness. How many times do we say God is good, God is good, God is great, God is good? And so you have to realize what He's speaking about here. Goodness of God. God is good. And so one of the awesome things about God is knowing that even though it may not be answered the way we want it to, God is good. And we should always understand that. So let's begin on uh, page 23. It's the top of the page. Christ's purpose was to make in himself of twain, meaning two, one new man. So making peace. This means in Christ, Gentiles don't become Jews and Jews don't become Gentiles. Believing Jews and Gentiles don't become hybrids. Instead, they become one new man, a new entity called Christians. Now, I want you to stop right there and listen carefully to what this actually means. It means that everybody knows that the Jew is God's chosen people. And, and a lot of people, you'll hear them say, when I became a Christian, I became a Jew. No, so. You became a Christian. Christianity. When the Jew got saved, he became a Jew. He became a Christian Jew. And you became an American uh, Christian. But the one thing that you have to see is the newness. And, and we're not adopted into the Jewish family. We're adopted into the family of God just like they are. And when I say they are, that means that I don't care what denomination, I don't care what kind of country you're from, whether it's Israel or the United States or where from Pakistan or wherever it's from. When you become a Christian, you become a, a new person. In other words, to understand that is uh, you don't become a Jew and, and this and that and, and so many uh, dis, discords that's been said about it and it's actually wrong doctrine. So Christ's purpose was to make in himself of twain one new man. That means that, you know, my old nature and, and, and me, and, and same as, as D.L. Moody put it, you know, if you're born uh, once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you'll die once. That's what he's saying. He said he took two and made one. So that's what he's talking about here. Not becoming a hybrid of some kind. Now, Christ did much more than make peace between Jews and Gentiles. As one body, Jews and Gentiles are reconciled unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Did, did Jesus die for the Jews and, and then later die for the Gentiles? No, he died for all men. And that's what he said. He told it, made it plain. So Gentiles are reconciled to God in one body by the cross, having slain the empty thereby. Therefore, we need to make sure there is no empty in our hearts toward anyone. That, in other words, anti-Semitism. There's not going to be that. Uh, black and white, that we have both that are racist. And the news media is the, is the one that continues to keep racism going. And it's just keeping the people stirred up. But it's a tool of the devil. So you got to realize the thing that's going to happen like uh, before the end of time, that's going to be the whole thing. It's going to be based on really uh, anti-Semitism. It's going to be racism. No races will enter the kingdom of God. Now remember that. So a lot of people that I talk to and they talk about how they love the Lord and you've mentioned something and they start the N word or these kind. What are you doing? What are you doing? How, 
That's, that's telling me that you don't you don't think God is, could be the father of a black man? You don't think God could be the father of, a, of an Indian? Or do you don't think God can be the father? God can be the father of whoever is born again through him as one. And we need to get this other stuff out of our mind. I hear people say over and over and over and over, well, I was born in the South. I can't help it. That's the way it is. Yes, you can. No different than when you get up in the morning and you mad, you chose to be mad. Oh, no, it, I don't know why I'm mad. I'm just mad. Well, choose to be unmad. So you have to understand that it is a choice. Homosexuality, it's a sin. Oh, I was born that way. No, you chose to be that way. Don't come stating and blaming it on any kind of genealogies. It doesn't happen. You've done that because you wanted to do that. And like any sin, it needs to be asked forgiveness for and go forward. And that's what God was hoping that we'd do. So we have to see here, if we're not careful, the middle wall of partition can arise and create a barrier between believers. However, there is no room in Christ for jealousy, arrogance, racism, hate, or prejudice of any kind. You know what? This describes our government today. I don't care whether it's Democrat or Republican. Well, let me say this to you and make sure. They talk about being Christians. The Democrats do. The Republicans do. The Independents do. There is no Christian party in the United States government. There is no Christian party. Uh, they are doing what they do because they want to. And therefore, they need to understand. They need to repent. So Christ came to earth and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. This is why Isaiah predicted he would be called the Prince of Peace. Now, let me tell you something. Somebody asked me, said, you don't seem like it's bothering you the things that's going on. Well, what am I supposed to do? I have a peace in me, and this is why I, I use this. When God says, take your sickness and glorify me. Well, let me tell you how I glorify God. I glorify God by telling somebody, says, you act like this is not even bothering you, including this is in my family. And I said, well, it, it, I guess it does bother me. I mean, you know, uh, but it ain't bothering me. I don't know if you can get that understanding. I have a peace that I can't buy. I have a peace that I can't make up. And by the way, Jesus says, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, if, if I'm in your heart, you've got my peace. Well, I guess that's why I'm not so upset. I have the peace of God in my heart. And if you don't have peace in your trials and tribulations, you need to repent and get God in your heart. That way you'll have peace. He is the only true peace. Nothing else. Nothing can give you peace. You might have a, a temporary uh, enjoyment uh, of something, but the peace in your heart will never subside until Christ is in your heart. Now, that's the way it is. That's why Isaiah predicted he would be called the Prince of Peace. In Christ, we have a peace that is out of this world. We have peace with God, peace with people, inner peace called the peace of God. That's why Jesus makes what declaration in John 14, 27? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is not the peace of sins forgiven. You better understand that. It's the peace of heart and mind of those who are in the will of God, those who are fully yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you something. I want to give you a good example of that. They're on the Sea of Galilee, and I mean a horrific storm is going up. Where was Jesus? Asleep. The Prince of Peace wasn't afraid of anything. There was nothing going to disturb him. But what about the disciples? Oh, are you going to let us drown? Get up! Get up! Help us! We're going to drown! He said, you have little faith. You see, he was in the boat with them. But he wasn't in their heart. So when he said, to tells the storm to subside, it did. The winds and the waves all just settled down. 
Who is this that can make the wind stop doing? Who is this can can make this? Oh, who can do this? Can make the waters lay flat? Well, he's the one that needs to be in your heart because that's why the storms can't rage and the winds can't blow it down. Because when you have this peace, you got a peace forever and ever and ever. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you see, the peace I have can't be taken out. It can't be moved. And so when you put your faith where you put your sins, you'll find that the peace of God in your heart can calm any storm, any storm of life and all these things. I, I wish I could get this across to so many people that won't let go of the past and have no peace in their heart. They just, just don't. I, I don't know if they, they love being in such a turmoil or, or what it is, but I would sure love to see the people realize that the Prince of Peace needs to dwell in your heart for you to have peace. Now, through Christ, Jews and Gentiles both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The word translated access means admission. It denotes the right to enter through the assistance of another. The Greek word pictures someone being presented to a king in his throne room. Through Christ, we gain access to God's throne room. That's why we have what wonderful assurance found in Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, we can speak freely to the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell him things I cannot tell you. I, I can, uh, as I went in to get Joe's things to set it up for tonight. I just had to, when I draw there at the front, you have to realize that I just have to have a word with the Lord. And it was just a, a wonderful moment. And uh, I, if it hadn't been so cold, George, I'd probably stayed up there. <laughs> it's an enjoyable moment with God. Now, it denotes the right to enter through the assistance of another. So we can speak freely to the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell him things I can't tell you because he understands me. He knows my weakness. He is God. He, he's my God, and I can come to him with confidence. God's throne is the throne of grace. It was formerly a throne of judgment with me, but now it's a throne of grace. But it's not a throne of mercy. Mercy speaks of the past, and grace is the present. Understand that. Now, the access involves the entire trinity, for it is through him, Christ, by one spirit that we have access unto the Father. Not only do we have access, but when we don't know what to ask or pray, the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Did you know what that's meaning in every way? You know, you say, well, you know, I want to tell you something if I can just find the words. Well, the Holy Spirit knows the words. He, it, it, he knows your heart. This is, this is something that, so when, when you say, you know what, uh, all of a sudden you start speaking in your prayer and you say, <laughs> Wow. I wish I would recorded that. I didn't know I could pray that good. Well, it's not you. It's in the Holy Spirit in you speaking to God for you to make your needs be met. And that's what it's speaking about here. Okay. There are times we are so distressed we don't know what to pray. So the Holy Spirit voices our prayers to God for us. Without prayer, we're all, we're alienated from God, and with Christ, we have access to God. However, it gets better. In Christ, we are accepted as God's family. Verse 19, Joe. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, in these verses, Paul uses the illustration of a family to explain who we are in Christ. We who are Gentiles are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You know, it's amazing to me that growing up, I watched the churches, and they, they were in awe of saying this is brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so and 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 if, if even if a person wasn't a member of their church uh, and was a member at another church if that person was in need the churches rallied i mean it was a good time 
And uh, but today it, it just doesn't seem to be that we have that unity like God wants us to have. And the unity has to start within the church before the church can have unity with somebody else. You know, when I first came, that was one of the things I wanted to do is above all is have a sister church that we could have uh, things with. And we did that with uh, uh, the one down in South Gaston, Berea, not Berea, what is it? Where uh, Walter and Amelia Prescott were. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn. Anyway, we, we had some time. They came up here. We went down there. And then we had it with uh, some others. But it's something that that really needs to be set aside. But now today with the COVID, that's impossible. I mean, you just can't do it. But I'm just saying to you that it is something that, that really would start bringing it. In our revivals, we have different denominational people and different uh, ethnic people to come in and preach and be a, a part of our family. But let me ask you something. Do you think that broke down any racial barriers or denominational barriers? You see, we don't know. We only thing we know is we're trying to set an example. And so I know that at, at Thanksgiving, uh, the churches sometimes, they'll get together, the Methodists, Presbyterians, the Lutherans, and the Baptists, or Free Wills, or whatever. They'll come together and have a, a service that, you know, the Baptist church is going to have service over to Lutheran church or the Lutheran church is going to have it over to Methodist church or the Methodist church is going to have it over at this church and that church. In other words, what I'm saying is this was a way of trying to do it, but we only do it one time a year. Just one time a year. And, and that doesn't break anything down. And so I've heard many times people say, you know what, I really, I really didn't know the Lutherans could uh, have that kind of scripture. Or, well, it's the same Bible. Well, I mean, I just can't imagine a Lutheran pastor being able to bring the word like that. You know, I could swear it was Baptist. Well, you know what? The Lutheran says, you know, I could swear that Baptist preacher was Lutheran. So there you go. You see, it's really the whole same thing. We just want to have it branded different. And it's not right. It stops us from having that unity. In these verses, Paul uses the illustration of a family. And that's what he's talking about here. We who are Gentiles are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Being fellow citizens means in Christ we become members of God's divine kingdom. But as though that were not enough, we are also become members of the household of God. The word translated household means family. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 9, when we pray, we should begin our prayer in what way? Who has that? I got that. <laughs> uh, okay. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your name. You know, God's more than a creator. He's the one sitting on the throne of all things, created and not created. He's in control. We pray, hallowed be thy name. But do we live as his hallowed name means? Holy, lies, honesty, holy, lies. That's what we're to do. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But I'm not holy. I'm... I'm, I'm I'm a hypocrite to call him hallowed when I'm not, I'm not living that life that I can proclaim. Jesus didn't say pray like this. He said pray in this manner. Pray in this manner. And so it's very important we understand that. So the Church of Jesus Christ is not an organization or a social club. It's family. I wish everybody would understand that. I do. I mean it. We'd have, we'd have a joyful time in church and our worship services for everybody to realize we're family. We're family. Therefore, we can just be yourself because you're loved and accepted no matter your skin color, your background, your social status, or whatever, because we're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, without Christ, we're alienated from God. With Christ, we have access to God. In Christ, we're accepted as God's family. But wait, there's even more. Together, we experience God's awesome power in Ephesians 2, 20 verse through 22. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, and whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You know, after using the illustration of a family, Paul used the illustration of building a, a temple which has three elements, a foundation, a cornerstone, and a building. Did you know that that same foundation should be in your heart? Look at it again. The foundation. What is the foundation? The Word of God. What is the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. He is the Word. And then the building. Well, that's my body. And that new body that's in me is, is really going to be the temple where he resides. Therefore, Paul writes, we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Did you know, uh, listening to that uh, Jewish rabbi that's a Christian, he said, made it very plain. He said, the problem we have today uh, is our foundations a lot of times. And we have people proclaiming to be prophets and proclaiming to be apostles. Well, there's no apostles today. Uh, you don't have that. And because God stopped that because you heard at the very beginning the requirements it takes. There are six requirements to be an apostle. Let me see if I can run back over here just briefly and let you know what they mean. Well, the requirements to be an apostle. The apostle received their commission directly from the living lips of Jesus. The apostle must have seen the risen Christ after his resurrection. The apostle exercised the special inspiration to write the scriptures. The apostle experienced supreme authority. The badge of their authority was their power to work miracles. Six, they were given a universal commission to found churches. Those are the six requirements. We don't have that today. We have churches that wants to uh, sponsor a church or build a church or found a church, and that's okay. But you can't meet all six of those requirements because you didn't see the resurrected Lord. And see, God has not made himself visible to you. So these are very, very important points. So we see that, that he's talking about a building. Therefore, Paul writes, we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the words they're talking about. The word translated prophet means an inspired speaker or proclaimer of divine message. See, I'm a prophet. No, no, before somebody starts calling me and say, you really a prophet? I am a prophet chosen of God to bring forth his message of what he says. Not that I'm making a forecast that, you know, if you want to know what the lottery numbers for tomorrow night is, come see me. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the Word of God as it's being preached, past, present, and the things to come. So that is the prophesying that I didn't do, but taking it from God's Word to use that as a prophecy, the words I speak are prophetic. Not pathetic, prophetic. Meaning these are the things that have happened, this is the proof of them happening, and this is what's going to happen. Now, today we, could, we would call him a preacher who proclaims the word of God. Now, the spiritual building, the church, has Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In ancient times, stonemasons would choose just the right cornerstone because it would keep the rest of the building plumb and square. Do you know when they built the temple? Do you know where they got the, uh, you know where they got the stones? Well, if you went under the city of Jerusalem, they are, I'm telling you, I would probably say 50 or 60 miles of tunnels where they have taken out those huge stones, cut them out, and brought them up, brought them out. And, and they used those places down underneath to flee from uh, armies when they would come. All right, this means all our attitudes and actions must be aligned with Christ. How does Philippians 2.5 express this principle? Oh, I can give out? Okay, so Kay, start off with it. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
Humility, you and I cannot be humble. We can't be meek. Why? Well, we want to stand on our own two feet. We don't allow anyone to offend us. We'll not stand for being ignored. We'll not allow ourselves to be trampled on. That's why That's why we, we fast and humbling ourselves and pray. We just won't do it. We just won't. Our pridefulness that we say we're not proud, and yet we are. We fail to humble ourselves. Listen, when God's speaking in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, and he's making it plain. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He's, he is, and I, they, that's important. Do you know how many times we pray, God, I pray your hand be upon this situation. He said, seek my face, not my hand. If I seek his face, his hand will be in whatever I'm needing it to be in. Not what I want him to be in, but what need. But I must seek his face. How do I seek his face? In his word. Reading and praying as you go and meditating upon the things of God. That's how you seek his face. Taking your Bible and you just decide that uh, I'm going to read this. You know, uh, there's some something that's popped up in my mind. I want to read it. Well, I told you about Exodus chapter 33. There's a good start if you want to seek his face. See what he had to say to Moses. Take that chapter down and read the whole thing. And that'll be your devotional time. You say, Lord, I'm going to seek your face in this. That's what the pastor was talking about. And and so then that would be your beginning. And as we go through some of these things and something outstanding comes to you, use it. That's a time you need to sit down, have a quiet time, and, and make sure that you seek the face of God. Now, we have to realize that we're prideful and we need to humble ourselves. If our attitudes are the same as Christ, our actions will be too. Therefore, in Christ, all the building is, is fitly framed together. The phrase fitly framed together translates a Greek word, Greek word that refers to a masonry project in which stones are snugly joined together. This means each part of the building, each believer, fits perfectly into the building because God creates us with personalities, talents, and intellects to fit perfectly in the church. The purpose of the whole building or church is that it groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Now, we all know this. We've heard it enough from our past pastors and, and even your present pastor today. Now, and I say to you, is the building up there, is those stone and is the bricks and the windows and the floors and the carpet and the pews, is that the church? No. We are the church. That's why he's saying it here. The purpose of the whole building or church is that it groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. What if we were one and when we come in to worship this Sunday? Man, you know what? Uh, it, it would probably, you'd feel the, uh, the deliciousness of the Holy Ghost as, as it would just settle down everything and, and just seems to give you and opens up your mind to, to receive the knowledge and the word and the meaning of the word as we would go forward. Now the word groweth means the building is not complete, but grows as new believers are added. Now, the function of this, belief, this spiritual temple that is being built is to become a habitation of God through the Spirit. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle and later the temple represents God's presence with His people. Now God dwells in His new temple, which is not a physical building, but the hearts of living believers. How does 1 Corinthians 3.16, Sam, tell us that? Rose, you take the next one. Okay. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. You know, our very bodies belong to Him. Our eyes, our ears, our feet, our mouth. Do they show proof of my body being a holy temple? Now you stop and think about it. You, 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 you're the one that has to judge yourself. Do the way you act today, just what you've done today, does it prove that you have uh, you are the body of the holy temple? I mean, think about it. When you go to bed at night and you lay down, take a look back at the day and say, Lord, I've desecrated your temple today. God have mercy on me. 
help me to do better tomorrow. Or you have that peace that you did do what God wanted you to do. And you say, Lord, I pray that I've glorified you this day through my body. And that's what we do. And that's how we live. So God's temple is the body of believers, both individually and corporately. When Christians gather together, there is a sense of God's presence and power that cannot be experienced individually. What does the last phrase of 1 Corinthians 5, 4 tell us? Is present when we are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we, when we are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul's telling them that if a believer is not going to inherit to the thing, uh, if that brother will not forsake his sins, then uh, they deliver him over to Satan. Do you hear Satan? And that's it. Now you say, wait a minute, preacher, that, that's tough. Well, let me remind you of something. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan desires to sift you. He didn't stop Satan from sifting Peter. Peter needed to sit there. Peter needed to see who he was. You know, I couldn't help but think of Mama's old sister when you'd take that, that uh, we didn't have the flare like we did today. It was sort of grainy. Sometimes it would have chunks in it. And you'd just take that thing, you know, and, and some of them had a little crank on it. Y'all remember, don't you? Yeah. Now, some of these young folks that's listening, they ain't going to, they don't know one thing. They'll think that preacher's fishing. But he ain't fishing. He's sifting. That's right. He's sifting flour. He's sifting that flour. That's what it is. And the Lord told Peter that Satan desired to have him sifted as wheat. Now, the Lord permitted Satan to sift Peter. Now, Satan will sift the forsaken brother or sister. And let me tell you something. God will permit it. You know, we have a lot of people that wonder what's going on in their lives. Satan sifted them. You know, they, they may have had a little fault of coming to church or had a little bit. Of, let's just say one of y'all have been talking to somebody that's lost. You say, you know, you need to come to church. You need to come here. Uh, we'd love for you to come, or I'm praying for you. Well, that person begins to start thinking about what you said, whether you realize it or shows on him or her. But what happens now is Satan starts to sift them and tell them they're not worthy. They can't do that. So Peter, though, Paul, he, he, he could, oh, I'm perfect for you already, Lord. I don't need to have any changes in my life. I'd die for you. And he meant every word of it. But when he was sifted, he found out he was a liar. And God let him know it. Do you know that's what we do? Same thing. Same old thing. Oh, I'm holy, man. Let me tell you something. Every single one of us is weak as water. But when we get together, we're a strong body of water. And that's what we need to understand here. George, you're going to take the last one. When spiritual stones meet together, we experience God's power in a unique way. That's why we should invite and bring our unchurched relatives, friends, and associates to Bible study and worship services. On the day of Pentecost, miraculous things happen. Therefore, we must never forget what fact found in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. They were all with one accord in one place. Did you know what Pentecost means? It means 50th because it was the, uh, after it was 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, Jesus arose from the dead on the first day of the week, it became the first fruits of them that slept. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 uh, tells us, but Pentecost also took place on the first day of the week, Sunday, and it was also on the day on which the Holy Spirit was given to the church. Now, let me refresh your mind. Pentecost means 50. Pentecost was 50 days after the Feast of First Proofs. Pentecost happened on Sunday. God gave the church the Holy Ghost on Sunday, the first day of the week. Everybody understand that? When Christ said, I have a new covenant I make with thee, this is what it's going to be. 
You see, it wasn't summed up, and they didn't say, well, what all is it? No, God is not going to start telling you so you can write it down. He's going to show you. And so as you begin to read the Scriptures, you find out why. Pentecost was the first day of the week. It was 50 days after the celebration of first fruits, which is the, the risen Lord. So now you have to realize that the first fruits was Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. He was the Lamb without blemish. Pentecost means 50th. But Pentecost also was the very day, the first day of the week. And the first day of the week is when God said, the Holy Spirit will fall upon them. What happened? Read your scriptures about, uh, about Pentecost and the fiery tongues and, and all the things that took place. And, and here's men speaking in a language they they knew they couldn't do, but the Holy Ghost was speaking through all these men at different different groups and different places and without losing one word as a witness. That's how powerful God is. So when we meet together, miracles still happen. Lives are changed. Relationships are restored. And people are saved. If you want to experience the awesome power of God, don't miss corporate worship and Bible study. Let me say this to you. There are certain things that you will sit down by yourself and meditate on that God will reveal to you. And then there are things that God will only reveal to a group. There's things he'll reveal to an individual, but there's things that he'll reveal to a group. And when I say that, I'm fixing to show you the wish wash. What God reveals to the individual, he will not reveal to the group. What he reveals to the group, he will not reveal to the individual. But when we become one, we become the power of God, knowing it, it is shared from the one to the group. Everybody understand that? That's a hard little thing to understand. That's why God says that we need to come together and worship together as one. And God wants us to do that. So without Christ, we're alienated from God. With Christ, we have access to God. In Christ, we're accepted as God's family. And together, we experience God's awesome power. Any questions? Any comments? Sam, dismiss us, please. Father, thank you for allowing us at the end of this opportunity to be in your house and study your word. Thank you for the day that we can come and do this again. We hope that someday we'll have more in here when the COVID's over. But right now, Lord, we just thank you for all our justice tonight to do this. And as we go through the rest of the week, we ask your blessing upon our lives to keep us safe. Amen. Thanks, Sam. God bless y'all.